What is your name, your occupation, and where do you work? Well, my name is Bob Dallas, and I'm an attorney by trade, and uh, I work in Atlanta, Georgia. How would you describe your occupation to someone who's not familiar with injury prevention or public health? Well, if I talk about it from an attorney perspective, then that's not directly related to injury prevention and public health. But I think my background as being an attorney has really helped me out. I'm a commercial litigator. I deal with disputes typically between businesses, a lot of contract issues uh, where one side says the other has breached, but things of that nature. Uh, in public health, I have to go way back uh, to really give a perspective as to how I started in all of this. And back in 1989, when I was a much younger attorney, uh, an email went out in my firm at the time, and one of the partners was saying his wife, who's very big into injury prevention on the side of uh, water safety, had uh, met with two other doctors and another public health official, and they wanted to start a group called Safe Kids of Georgia. And Safe Kids uh, is a national organization, and it's also in many of the different states. Well, back then it was brand new and it was an idea envisioned by Marty Eichelberger, who was the head of Children's Hospital in DC and by far the most favorite, uh, famous um, Surgeon General C. Everett Koop. But in it, the um, two of them had brought together a lot of practitioners from the various states to say, you know, we looked at the data and the data is telling us that what is killing our kids, seriously injuring them um, is really not the kinds of diseases that we tend to talk about, but the preventable injuries, the accidents that we don't like to use the term to describe uh, these things, but bike crashes, car crashes, smoke inhalation, drowning, um, swallowing different you know, drugs and pills and things that you know, would injure the kids. So the question was, how do we come up with a process and a program that can help change those kinds of outcomes? Well, anyway, the email went around the, the firm and I responded and said, yeah, I'd like to help out. Um, I had a very young son at the time and the um, need that they had was really loyally help set up the formation, get their nonprofit status. Well, the long and the short of it is I became very involved with the organization and uh, served on its board, served as chair for probably over a decade and also was very active in going to the legislature because what we found in setting up this public health model was that we have a lot of really good data, but we didn't have the policies at the state level to help change outcomes. And uh, what was so unique back then, which today is very commonplace, is the way Safe Kids was organized. It wasn't just a top-down organization that at the state level we said, this is what you need to do. But instead, it was a coalition-based organization that looked out where the hotspots were in the state, looking at the assets of those local communities and then developing solutions uniquely tailored for their concerns. Well, where does public health come on all of this? Without the model that public health provided us, as well as the analysis of the data, there would no way that there would be no way that this organization could be successful. And so if we fast forward to today and we look at the decades now of changes in our state laws, implementing policies at the local level, the kind of support through coalitions that exist throughout the state of Georgia, uh, what we have found is that we've been able to change the trajectory of serious injuries and deaths to kids under 14. Well, for me then, you know, that really led to my involvement in what I found the most fascinating, but the most troubling, and what that was, you know, what's the data pointing to in the state of Georgia that's really, really problematic? And of course, that's how we utilize our most public uh, asset, which is, of course, our roadway system. And so from that, I was um, able to get focused on legislation and background vis-a-vis -vis the public health model in developing legislation that really, I think, changed outcomes in the state of Georgia as to how safe we are in our roadway systems. But um, like I say, as an attorney, uh, for me, uh, going through the legislature, understanding how the laws work, both in terms of how they're written, how you work with legislators to get them passed, and importantly, how they're interpreted by the courts is key. Because you know, so often what we find is that you know we throw out a policy either vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what we say to the public or laws that guide the public, and we don't go back and ask ourselves a simple question: Does it work? 
if we don't do that, then we're not really doing our job. And as we know, that's really the, the public health model is to always constantly come back, look at the data, develop policies, implement policies, see how the policies are doing, look at the data, change your policies. And it's perpetual because the process is really one of learning. Bob, I would like to ask you, um, since you've been a part of this world, uh, public health and injury prevention for so long, where do you think the future of injury prevention is headed? Have we hit our targets throughout the past 30 years? Where do we still need to focus? What policies do you think are, are really important right now, just, just in general? I firmly believe that because over the many years, not just folks like me or us working together in the public health, but really across different fields, that the legislators, the city council members, and the commissioners are getting more and more information. So the key for us is we're, you know, we have all this information, we have all these practices, and we, you know, present it to policymakers. They want to know about it, but they're inundated with a lot of information. So how do we narrow that information into a fashion that causes them or allows them to act? And, and that's a challenge. And, you know, if you ask me what the fundamental most important thing is, is, okay, we've got a great public health system. If we listen to it, we need more means by which to gather data, which a lot of us are constantly working on to, to get data that's better and quicker access to it and being able to manipulate it better. Um, we can package it in such a way based on either tests that we've done or other jurisdictions have done this or other countries have done that. And we can present it to policymakers. But along that route, I think too often we've forgotten what I consider now the most important thing, and that is engaging the public. Um, we have patted our, ourselves on the back a lot of times with how good a job we do with gathering data, how we analyze it, how we develop policies, how we show this will work. I hear a policymaker do something. We have not done as good a job reaching out to the public before and then bringing them in so that they understand what those policies mean. So I think we as public health professionals would do a lot better if in this process we said along the way, you know what, anything that we ask the public to do, we probably should involve the public in defining what that ask is, how we implement it, have a good conversation, look at the aspirational goals, and then identify those common concerns common ways to achieve the goals consistent with what the good public health policy should be based on data and best practices. Thank you, Bob. What excites you most about your occupation? Well, a lot of different things. Um, I mean, I, I, I do love the idea of setting up systems that gather excellent data. And, you know, when we see lapses in data, either through it's dated or there are holes or gaps in the data, and we can't reach conclusions supported by data. I, I, I love seeing develop, you know, having the opportunity to develop systems. And, and I've been fortunate to, to have help from the state of Georgia. Um, when I became highway safety director back in 2003, 100% of the crash records were paper, right? An officer would write at us, a trooper officer or sheriff's deputy would write, arrive at a scene and have to write up a, a crash report. Now, let me just say this. I mean, these are dynamic situations, right? You've had a crash. You're in the weather. It could be summer where it's 110 degrees, or it could be winter where it's just miserably cold and wet and it's 20 degrees. I mean, that's not a good environment to do these things. You're having to repeat writing things over and over again. And by the way, those of us who want the data to make decisions as a policymaker, it's a year old at best, two years, three years. And we need a little bit more current data and you can't manipulate it in a way that's really meaningful. So we went about the process of changing Georgia's crash record collection system from manual to mechanized. So basically almost 99% of the crash records in the state of Georgia are now mechanized, you know, the computers, uh, much more accurate, much, much more timely. Uh, we are able to answer questions that we just couldn't answer before. 
So that, that to me is one of the most exciting things. But secondly, a, a couple other areas is, is one, working with policymakers to try to get policy through legislatively. I remember one year, it was kind of interesting. I think it was the uh, bike helmet bill that we uh, put forward. It was the last bill voted on in both the Senate and the House before they were uh, 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 suspended for the year signing die. And you know, your, your, your heart's beating thinking, they're not gonna get to my bill. It's almost midnight. And then when they both got to that at their last bill at the same time, it's mm -hmm. like, holy smokes, there's, there's not a better feeling than that. And then of course, then the governor signing that. Um, but the other is what I was talking about the, before. And that is when you have a really good opportunity to get, engage the public and reach a consensus on what to do, there is nothing you cannot do. And when that happens, it's almost magical because it takes a lot of work I think that's really awesome. I think a lot of what you said also goes back to just like the interdisciplinary nature of public health and really engaging all sides. I think that's yeah. really great. Well, you, you you can't move forward, in my opinion, with any authority or you know ability to reach out to people absent having a foundation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it becomes a house of cards. I mean, I've got opinions all day long. Uh, However, my wife and my kids probably disagree on occasion with my opinions. <laughs> but having said that, when we move into the public sphere, it is so key that we have the foundation. I don't know where else to get that foundation, but through our partners at public health. So the ones at Emory, the ones at the Department of Public Health at the state of Georgia, uh, our good friends at Georgia Department of Transportation who provide us a lot of the data that we use in the uh, transportation field and uh, a whole lot of partners through other agencies. Well, you've got to have a foundation that brings people together. And, and that's where the public health component comes in, whether it's in providing the data and analysis and policies or the models to make things work. And I've seen time and time again where people's way of doing business has shifted towards what we find very common in public health. And I hearken back again, back to 1989, when Safe Kids came to fruition in Georgia, nobody had a statewide organization that was locally coalition based, looking at the local resources with data and best practices to achieve outcomes that they cared about. Nobody had that model. Today, thankfully, it's a very common model. And I, I'll have to note this. I mean, obviously we, we've seen over the many years a very long and sometimes tortured debate over what's the best system for our health care. The one thing I know we all can agree with is prevention. Mm -hmm. like if we don't have that injury to begin with, if we don't have that illness to begin with, if we have longevity that doesn't result in chronic conditions that tax the public health system, then we are reducing the cost of health care that no matter whose model you look at, none of us can afford. Prevention is a key to success. Awesome. All right. So we have a certificate program at Emory. It's mm -hmm. the Injury and Violence Prevention Certificate. The purpose of the program is to enhance graduate education and prepare students to become leaders of injury and violence prevention within their chosen discipline. What would be well, your advice to someone who's considering the certificate program? Well, take it. Um, because here's the thing, you know, you, you, you've gone through four years of undergraduate school you've learned a lot of great things. Um, what you may not realize is how needed you are. You take somebody like me, you know, I may know where the data comes from. I may know the conclusion of this an analysis, but I don't know, I, I'm not qualified to go through that process. But I think what's in, you know, a, a crunch of the numbers as it were. Um, but I think what's important is for folks to, to recognize that with that skill set, if that person is able to understand how that data and those policies can be used for betterment, that, that's where that certificate program comes in, is the ability to translate what you have learned into actual outcomes. And that, that's key, and that's hard, because it's not quick, it's messy sometimes, because we're engaging the public and policymakers, but I submit to you, there's nothing more satisfying. So there is a host of opportunity out there that we need to have 
experts that come out of the public health understand how their knowledge is applied in the public sector, which is basically to say, how do you have the public improve their behavior in a way that makes for a better outcome? And it's dynamic. And that's really, to me, the, the most exciting part. But the certificate program helps one gain that knowledge in a very compressed way and then go out and, and succeed, I think, a lot quicker. And, um, you know, I dare say no matter where you live, no matter what state, community, uh, that expertise is needed. And, and, and I, I would also give this thought, you know, it would also allow you to consider other arenas where that public health model make a whole lot of sense. So I mentioned to you earlier, I've been a planning commissioner for a lot of years. And recently in the past several years, I've seen uh, planners uh, change how they do things in a way that, wow, that looks like a public health model. Mm -hmm. So I think it expands your opportunities in areas that you can't even describe today for things that are needed in the future. And so getting that certificate in program really arms you with opportunity to do really great things. If you're interested in applying to the IVP certificate, then email Dr. Dorian Lamis. You can also learn more about the certificate by visiting us on our website or social media.